<clears throat> Excellent. I think I'll, several of the questions will be answered in the next half hour. Next, we'll hear from Brian Schleining. Brian is a senior software engineer in the research and development division at Ambari. He has worked on numerous projects involving video and video analysis, annotation, numerical analysis, user interface development, and data management systems for the past 25 years. Most recently, Brian has been the brains behind the back end of FathomNet and will now talk about the FathomNet website and API or Application Programming Interface. Who, for those who aren't familiar with the acronym, take it away, Brian. Thank you, Katie. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Uh, my, again, my name is Brian Schlenning. And very quickly, we're going to go through uh, just an introduction to the FathomNet website. Now, before we start the website, though, I've got a few. Um, points that I want to cover so that we're all on the same page as we look at the website. And if I can get my slideshow to work, there we go. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, Brian. Thank you. Okay, uh, as we go through this, um, as I go through the website, one thing I want to keep reiterating is that this is a beta. Uh, we developed what we thought was a a good tool around our ideas of what we needed to better enable machine learning for ocean researchers. But really part of the goal of this workshop is we wanna get your feedback on how we can make it work better for you. So keep that in mind as I demonstrate different features of FathomNet. Very briefly, what I'm gonna to cover today is just a little bit about the FathomNet concepts and architecture that you need to know to understand the website, a tour of the website, and at the end, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the data schema, and this is mostly targeted at people who might want to write applications later on, just to understand how the data is structured. And I promise uh, I will keep that brief. <clears throat> so the value of the architecture is really simple. Uh, we have images, and they're served through a web server. Web server does not have to be hosted at any particular place. It was designed to be distributed, so the images can live all over the world. Um, there's a we store. Uh, the localizations and other bits of information in a database, it's exposed to the world through what's called a web application programming interface. It's a very simple uh, way to communicate with our data store, um, and you can use that in all kinds of different programming languages. The Fathomit itself is actually a little application that runs in the browser on your computer. And as I go through this, one thing, a couple things. One, we are not developing yet another annotation tool. I'll talk more about that. I want to just really clearly define what localizations are. And I want to introduce the concept of taxonomy providers, which you're going to see when, as you navigate through FathomNet. The way we designed this is we didn't want to create yet another annotation tool. Everyone has great tools already. But you don't need another one to compete in that space. So the idea was that you would annotate with your preferred tool. Then you would export the localizations out into FathomNet. We've made it a very simple process for that, which I'm not gonna cover in detail here. It'll be covered in the taxonomy session. And once it's exported, it's your data will be available in FathomNet. Now we recognize that the data that is exported into FathomNet may not be perfect. Um, the idea is we wanna, as a community resource, we want to enable researchers to correct annotations and maybe add additional ones to improve it for machine learning. So FathomNet does have some lightweight annotation tools to help you refine annotation tools. Like in this case, you might know the species of this particular squid and correct it. <clears throat> and we only, uh, when we talk about annotations in FathomNet, we only take one type of annotation and that is the bounding box. And that consists of a couple parts. The first is just a label, you know, what did you see? And the second is just the definition of the bounding box in pixels in image coordinate system. Um, Image coordinate system is really simple. The origin is on the upper left. Uh, X is to the right, uh, plus Y is down. Now, taxonomy providers, uh, one thing that we really thought was important was we wanted people to be able to use uh, whatever names they thought was appropriate. In general, we're targeting um, the best uh, phylogenetic classification you can use. So if it if it's species, that's great. If you can identify something on the genus, that's great too. Um, but when you're searching, doing your search, and let's say you're training a machine learning model and you wanna do train on larvations, bathocordaeus, um, you might not, if, when you run a search just for bathocordaeus, you might not get everything you want. So that's where the taxonomy providers come in. And what this allows is when you select a taxonomy provider, you know, whether it's worms or embaris, 
uh, it'll, when you start to do searches, you'll see this little box that gives you some options. Do I want to do an exact match search or do I want to search for all descendants? And what that means is when I do an exact match, I'm only searching for exactly what I requested. And that will give you the results for that. In this case, uh, you know, 1,290 results. But I might want to extend it through all different types of Bathocordaeus. And that's where I would select all descendants using, in this case, worms. What will happen is a found that goes to worms and say, what are all the different types of Bathocordaeus? And then it takes that name set and extends the results, the search results. And then so you get back far more results. <clears throat> We've already mentioned this. Um, okay. So I'm going to go to my web browser and take you for a quick tour of FathomNet. Bear with me one second. All right. Uh, everyone should be seeing my web browser right now. And so this is the FathomNet landing page. And you'll see this box right in the middle. This appears again and again on the different pages in FathomNet, but it has three uh, search areas, um, the what, the where, and the taxonomy provider. I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. I'm just gonna scroll down a little bit though, just a little bit more, and just mention there's a little statistics section down below as images get contributed to FathomNet, this is just updated. And so it shows the number of current localizations in FathomNet the number of images and the number of contributors. And in this case, the contributors are people who have actually created the annotations. So uh, each, each individual annotation is tagged by the person who labeled it. And that's what you're seeing here. So I'm gonna go to the top. I'm gonna just click on the Explorer. And this will take us to our main search page. Again, you'll see the what, where, and taxonomy provider here. And these allow you to turn, constrain different searches. So we're gonna do a search for Bathocordaeus. It's one of our favorite little animals. And I'll run a search for that just by clicking here. And it'll show results. And you can see the result. If they have uh, lat latitude and longitude, they'll appear on the map. And then you'll see a listing of the images to the side. And we'll look more at these images in a second, but I just wanna continue through the different ways to constrain a search. Now I might want to say, well, I really only want Bathocordaeus in the Gulf of California. So I'm only interested in training models for a region. So we can do that for search. And you can see now we just get the results for that region. And I'm also going to add, oh, I want to I want to search for all types of Bathocordaeus. So right now we have 19 results. I'm going to, you see there's three different taxonomy providers, just real briefly. Uh, the FathomNet one is a subset of worms. Um, it's, it's a very robust, fast uh, taxonomy provider. There's Embaris, which specializes on the west coast of California. And then there's the worms API itself, uh, which uh, is fine, but we're kind of abusing the way uh, the worms API. And so sometimes when you do larger searches, um, it takes too long to respond and your search will fail. So we'll just extend with the FathomNet search. We'll see if, again, we'll see the exact match in all descendants. And that didn't extend the search here. So we'll take out the region. We'll run the search for the whole world. And you can see before we had about 1,290 results and now we're getting our 3,200 results. You can also just, we'll get rid of these, clear these out. You can actually do uh, searches for just regions. These regions are from marine regions, uh, another great resource if you're looking for uh, areas of the world. And so now we can just see the annotations for Hawaii. Okay. <clears throat> now, under this, underneath the search bar, you'll see these other uh, search constraints. We can search by dates. So we can say, oh, I would just want annotations for images that were captured between certain dates. We have support for imaging types. The idea behind imaging types here is that uh, we recognize that people are gonna have different ways of capturing image. Maybe they have some special low light cameras or maybe it's some kind of, um, I, I don't know, dark field imaging. So we want to give people the options to, 
to put that parameter in there so they can search exactly for the types of images they want to train their machine learning algorithms on. Um, we haven't really clearly defined what these types are yet. This is something that we need feedback on from the community. Uh, you can also search by owner institutions, you know, who contributed the images. And then we have this concept of verification status. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the idea here is that after someone has submitted images and their localizations, a third party of experts, you know, the community, which is you, could come in and look at the image and say, yes, this is indeed a FISONECT, or no, uh, this is mislabeled, and so it's not verified. And that way, if someone wants a really gold standard data set, they can come through and just search for verified images. Okay. Now I'm going to sign in. The sign in process is very simple. Currently, we support only logins with a, a Google account. Um, we have discussions on different logins that we might want to implement in the future. So if you have input or feedback on that, we would appreciate it. But just to be kind to the developers who had to write all this stuff, we're just going with Google for right now. And so now I'm logged in. And briefly, I'm going to go to my account page to show you that. So if you go to the main page, you'll see your little your your um, personal icon there. And if you go to this page, it shows you information about yourself. Now, by default, these fields will be empty. So if you do create an account, uh, we do ask that you go in and fill in your affiliation. So this would be tell you what your organization is, uh, your occupation, and then a little bit about yourself, especially your expertise, um, so that we know who you are. Uh, many of you we already know personally, but for those who don't, you know, we want to uh, make people aware of what your specialization is. All right, so I'm logged in. I'm going to go back to this page. My results are still there. And I'm going to go back to Dr. Cordes because I just think it's a great critter. And we'll run a search. OK. So now um, we see the results here. If you click on the map, you'll see a brief pop up that shows you the image that's at that location. And if you click on the image, either in the grid over here or on the map, it'll take you to the same page. And it shows you details about the image. And uh, there's a, in this case, there's a few localizations. If I hover over one, it fades out the other localizations of the image so you can see exactly which one it's focused on. Um, now, you'll notice there's a lot of blue here. It says this image needs to be verified. So when you first join FathomNet and get an account, you're given basically read-only status. You're not allowed to make changes. Um, what we would like is to engage people in the community. So after you fill out your expertise, is, and we'll talk more about this in the taxonomy sessions, but you can just send us an email to fathomnet at ambari.org saying, hey, I'm an expert in so-and-so. And I would like to be able to either contribute my images or moderate, you know, and fix content that's already there. And we'll give you permissions. And once you have those permissions, you can go in and you can edit the verification statuses, for example. So you can come click on one of these and say, yes, this is indeed about the Cordeus, and you can mark as verified. You can reject it, or oops, you can click on the image itself and, you know, modify the annotations, you know, there's the usual tools, um, or you can change it to something else. Um, now this autocomplete right now, I will mention, is based on Embari's knowledge base, so it's not complete. We, uh, we, we need your feedback on, you know, how best to implement this autocomplete to satisfy your needs. But for right now, this was a, um, a fast and robust uh, taxonomy provider to use. Anyway, you can make edits, change it. And then when you're done, you can save the details. And we're not going to save those details. We're going to go back. Oh, actually, and I will say, you can also uh, augment by adding additional annotations. So if I just clicked on this Add Annotation button at the top, uh, it'll generate a new bounding box that I can position wherever I want and add a label, like so. OK. <clears throat> Now, at each bottom, at the bottom of every page, if you're just scrolling through, say you're doing verification or editing, you can just click next and it'll quickly scroll you to the next image to move you through. 
Now, one other thing I'd like to point out is that um, every image may belong to one or more collections. And you'll see a collection label right here. And if you click on that collection, it'll jump you to that particular collection and display all the images that are in that collection. Now, a collection is the idea of a collection is it's a single upload. You know, you may have exported a data set from your tool, uploaded to Fathom, and now now becomes a single collection that you are the owner of. And uh, the, each collection has bits of Darwin Core metadata associated with it over here, and then of course there's the images in this collection. Okay. Now, a few other bits, uh, just to mention. Uh, under details, let's go back to the Explorer. This will be better here. We're going to click on a, an uh, image that actually has a position. And so under details, you can actually see the location, the depth, and the collection date, the, image, the date that this image was acquired. So when people submit data, they do not have to provide those details. But if you have them, it's great. Um, way to augment the data set. We also support other fields such as CTDO, uh, uh, salinity temperature, depth, and oxygen. And there's ways to tag images, which I'll describe a little bit more later. Okay. Uh, the one last bit that I will mention is that if you're writing applications to Fathom, that if you go to your accounts page, there's uh, a column called API key. And if you click on that, uh, you can generate an API key for yourself that you can use for accessing Fathomet through the REST API. Um, Kevin Bernard will present more about that later, but I just want to point out, this is where you get your API key. Never easy to create. And if you decide you're done with it, you just delete it and you can regenerate a new one later on, just like that. Now, when you submit images to Fathomet, we do have uh, a terms of use for the images, and I'm going to mention them right here. So let's we're going to start out with the Fathom data use policy. So when you contribute images or annotations to Fathom, that they are licensed under a very particular license called the Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 4.0 International License. And what this means is you're providing them free to the world for a very specific purpose. And the purpose for these images is defined right here. These images may be used for training and development of machine learning algorithms for commercial, academic, and government purposes. And that's it. Any other use of these images uh, are, are uh, if they're to be used for any other purpose, um, they the person has to contact you and get permission to use those images. Now we do have a few other amendments to that under the terms of use. Uh, if you are using these images for your own purposes, please acknowledge Fathomet in your publication or posters. Um, <clears throat> if you do any enrichments, we appreciate if you contribute it back. We have a community channels. Uh, we have a Medium page and a YouTube channel. We have uh, a GitHub. They're all linked here that we would really appreciate you to, to contribute your materials back to the larger community. And of course, the final terms of use is a benevolent use. You know, this data should only be used in ways that are consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. <clears throat> okay, now with that said, we're gonna switch back to the presentation. One second, please. Okay. Okay, so just a brief mention about the API again. Uh, it's all documented. So if you're writing your own applications, you can use this web, a oops, web API. I, where is it? I, uh, I have a link to it at the end of the slideshow. I'll bring it back up again. Uh, but just to go over the data schema really briefly, and I'll just give you a high level view. So this isn't actually it. So I can hear your sighs of relief. 
through the Zoom. Uh, this is it. So for those who are developing, it's a very simple schema. Uh, the whole idea is we're built around the pictures. We are basically a big fancy image browser for machine learning purposes. And each image, of course, we have some description of what's in the image. They're called bounding boxes. And because we can't plan ahead for everything, all the data you might want to include in your image, we support tags, which is a flexible way to store name value pairs attached to your image. So if you have quantum flux parameters and you want to store them in Fathom, that we've got your back. And just a few finer details. Uh, image, as I mentioned before, images can live every, anywhere. They do not have to be uploaded to Fathomnet. In fact, we encourage you to put them on your own servers and share them publicly. And we can link those into Fathomnet. Uh, we do store environment position data. So if you have that, please submit that with your images sets. Uh, every bounding box has a concept, the name, and it does not have to be a species or uh, even a phylogenetic taxa. We do support, you know, we have oil drums in there and rocks and other features that are, might be useful for the community. Uh, we also support the idea of an alternate concept. So we've been using it, for example, to localize part of an animal. And so we have an example here of we've localized a nectosome and anomia. Um, and we do track a lot of names. We, as mentioned before, we tracked who actually named the bounding box. We track who confirmed the name that's in the bounding box. We track who contributed the data and uploaded it to FathomNet. And of course, we always track who owns the images to make sure that they, their copyright is maintained. The API is, is well documented. Uh, it's available in different flavors of documentation. I have one flavor linked at the bottom. Um, and these slides are available, so you can refer to that link later on. And that is the end of my talk. So now it's time for questions. Great, thanks, Brian. We have, yeah, we definitely have a few minutes for questions. I see Kakani has been furiously answering many of them. Kakani, are there any unanswered that you'd like to um, throw to Brian? Yeah, let me, um, I'll, I'll try and do uh, some curation. So somebody actually asked a great question. How would someone go about citing FathomNet to give credit to all of those folks? I'm sorry, can you say it again? I was busy reading all the questions flying by in chat. Yeah, don't read them. Uh, don't, don't. How would, how would someone go about citing FathomNet to give credit to all of those folks? Uh, that's a great question, and we are actually working on that mechanism. But when you do get the downloads, uh, you do have a ways to link back to the contributors. Um, so there's different mechanisms for that. One is just, for example, uh, you would get a big download of JSON, for example. And you can archive that and generate a DOI for that through whatever your DOI provider is, you know, Zenodo or another service. And that way, all the, the contributions is preserved just in the data itself. Yeah, I'll, I'll also add to that because there's a, a number of different ways I know that we've been thinking about, you know, pro providing mechanisms for attribution. One of them, which I'll talk a little bit more detail, I can't remember if it's tomorrow, I think it's tomorrow, which is uh, an agreement we're currently working on with NOAA, uh, where they are going to look at versioning the database and generating a DOI. And so people that are contributing to particular versions of the database will actually use that DOI that will be associated with their, their contribution or their ORCID. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but so that's one way in which people can get credit for their contributions. But we're also envisioning other ways as well. Curious what your thoughts are too on that. Um, so another question, somebody asked if you can export metadata, um, you know, like lat long, et cetera. The answer is yes. Um, and I could show a little bit of the blob uh, of the data that comes out of Fabnet. I meant to do that, and then I did not. So one second. Yeah, can you do that? I'm share that. Um, so you can download images and annotations, you know, using this mechanism. Brian is going to share uh, from the website. There's also a Python API um, that <laughs> Kevin uh, will be going over in a few presentations. Um, so there's a number of different ways to to get data out of the database. So Brian. Right, and this is just an example. This is the raw data that you might get from the APIs itself. And so, you know, we have the depth, um, 
we have latitude, longitude, salinity, temperature, et cetera. There's one tag here. So, and then of course the bounding boxes are stored down here. So that's an example of the data you would get. And again, when you get the data back from Panda, you're not gonna download images directly. Instead, you'll have pointers like this that'll show you where the image lives. And there's different tools to fetch that data as needed. If I can chime in real quick, um, Brian, a few other questions that came up is like, which information does always come with it? What, what, what if the information in those JSON files is mandatory and will be present for all files? Is that just time? Uh, we actually cover that in the taxonomy workshop tomorrow, but the, the minimum data is the, the name, the concept that you saw, uh, a pointer to the URL and the bounding boxes, and that's it. You do not have to supply latitude, longitude, Sunday temperature pressure. Yeah, so that point somebody asks, does images have time metadata? They do, they're just not required for submission. Um, another question, any plan to implement labeling for semantic segmentation or are we just sticking to bounding boxes? So, uh, Brian? Um, the, that's a question for the community actually. Right now we supported bounding boxes because that's what most machine learning models that we use are working with. Um, but if there's a need for it, yes, we're happy to discuss it. Yeah, we're happy to make it work. Um, and then uh, Jen, of course, Jen Durden has a great question. Verified or unverified is very binary. How will you deal with future updates to naming? Worms has a facility for this type of name version control. So Jen, this is a great question and I'd love it if you could bring it into the taxonomy discussion because these are things that we're trying to figure out. Um, Brian didn't actually show or maybe highlight it, but there is a, F a FathomNet. Brian, do you want to talk about that? I can't believe you forgot. <laughs> if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, we're talking about the hierarchy browser. Yeah, the FathomNet, the new FastWorms FathomNet um, hierarchy. Oh, yeah, I. Let me mention a couple things here. Um, one thing I didn't mention is in the Explorer, uh, we have this hierarchy tree here. And so we'll go away. Let me just jump to a node in it. <clears throat> oh, I think everyone's on FathomNet right now. Um, so we do have this hierarchy Explorer. Again, this one is built off of Mari's knowledge base, but allows you to walk up and down the trees and you can select the node and then you can do searches based on taxonomic hierarchy. Uh, we, the reason it was built around Mbari's knowledge base was it was robust and fast and Worms API wasn't, uh, we're, again, we were abusing it and we're making it trying to do things that it wasn't meant for. However, just last week we wrote the FathomNet um, taxonomy provider and so I think the idea in the future might be, it, it, as one example is, you would select the taxonomy provider to, for the tree here. So you might select worms or the fathom that, and then it would appear here and you can navigate using that. Now these, I will mention that these taxonomy providers, just the ones that we had available to us, if you have your own naming service, like if you're using Katami codes and you can publish a naming service, we're happy to integrate that in the fathom that. Um, and so what Brian forgot also, you know the the, the FathomNet um, hierarchy or whatever is actually the the Worms uh, ape, um, hierarchy, right? That's up, updated every month. Um, and so this is going to be a discussion I think uh, that they're going to delve really deeply into as part of the taxonomy session about how do you accommodate, you know, undescribed species, you know, and hang those those uh, classes off of uh, an existing hierarchy. Um, the, right. the, the good point, the uh, as a because we have our own you know worms based uh, API, we can integrate anything we want into it. So we can integrate the geology if we want to put rocks in it, for example, or undescribed species. But again, that's something we need feedback from the community for. Yeah, 